my name is Chris DeVette and I'm currently an Associate Professor of New Testament and Early Christian Studies in the Department of Biblical and Ancient Studies at the University of South Africa, also known as UNISA, in Pretoria. I would especially like to thank the International Association for Patristic Studies for affording me this opportunity to speak with you today. Today I would like to speak to you about how one early Christian author, John of Ephesus, took care of his soul during a very difficult time, the time of the Justinian plague. Now this video was made at the height of the COVID-19 pandemic, and in my experience of this pandemic, I have come to realize one important thing, how we speak about illness and pandemics is very important. We might accurately say that, along with the biomedical dimensions of a pandemic or a plague, there also exists a potent and pervasive discursive dimension to a pandemic. We might speak of plague as a discourse, a way of speaking. In my presentation here, I will be less focused on biomedical or even hard historical aspects of the Justinian plague. Rather, I am interested to see how one man spoke about the plague and how this plague talk this discourse of the pandemic in his time functioned as a way to safeguard his soul. Why is this an important endeavor? Because we are realizing now, in the age of COVID-19 and its aftermath, that how we structure the discourse of a pandemic, how we speak about it, can have life and death consequences in our now fragile societies. And just as the Black Plague or the so-called Great Plague of the 14th century became the framework with which plagues and pandemics have been approached in the past, so too will COVID-19 become our new framework for making sense of pandemics or plagues. For John of Ephesus, the care of the soul seems to have been just as important as the care of the body, body during a time of a pandemic. Now, John of Ephesus was a missionary from the town of Amida in the late antique Mesopotamia who lived from about 507 to 586 of the Common Era. He was known for his anti-Chalcedonian, what used to be called Monophysite or Myophysite views. John wrote in Syriac, his account of the Justinian plague is part of a lost work of John, the second section of his church history, which has thankfully been preserved in part three of the so-called Chronicle of Zuknin, an 8th century work by an unknown author often referred to as Pseudo-Dionysius of Telmachre. The text, which is reproduced by Pseudo-Dionysius, is also published in the second volume of Land's Anecdota Syriaca. Now, the Justinian plague probably broke out in the early 540s during the reign of Emperor Justinian, hence the name the Justinian plague. From ancient accounts of the plague, as well as recent archaeological analyses of the DNA of skeletal remains of the period, it seems most likely that the Justinian plague was indeed caused by the Yersinia pestis bacterium, the one which causes the sickness of the bubonic plague. The hosts of these bacteria are usually fleas found on common black rats. When the fleas bite humans, they become infected with bubonic plague. The symptoms of the plague are very distinct. The most common sickness coming from the infection is bubonic plague itself, from the Greek word bubones, which, which refers to the painful lymph nodes that often occur closest to where the bacteria entered the skin. After the flea bites a person, the bacteria multiplies quite fast and the skin turns black. This is also why bubonic plague is also called the Black Plague or the Black Death. Symptoms occur between three to five days. And these include lymph nodes in the groin, armpit or neck, as well as fever, headache, fatigue and delirium. The bacteria will overwhelm the immune system and inflammation and sepsis follow. In a world without antibiotics, up to 80% of infected individuals die within a few days. Sometimes, however, the bacteria go directly into the bloodstream, which results in what we call primary septicemic plague. The immune system is overwhelmed quite fast here, and death from sepsis could occur quite swiftly, without any observable symptoms. 
secondary septicemic plague results from the bacteria entering the bloodstream from the lymph nodes. In this case, the bacteria clot in the capillaries, which results in petechiae, that is, tiny round brown or purple spots that come from the bleeding under the skin. Vomiting and diarrhea often follow. After the development of the petechiae, the victim might die within a day. Finally, there is also the less common pneumonic plague, the less common uh, form of the plague known as pneumonic plague, when the bacteria goes directly to the lungs, usually via an aerosol. Pneumonic plague was equally, if not more, deadly. Now the symptoms noted above are in most cases also described by John of Ephesus. He says, and I quote, Not only those who died, but also those who escaped sudden death, were struck with this plague of swellings in their groins, with this disease which they call bubones, and which in our Syriac language is translated as tumours. Here he probably refers to the lymph nodes. John of Ephesus further says, and I quote, Three signs became visible in the middle of the palm of a man's hand, in the form of black pox, which did not depart from the skin, but remained deep in it. They were like three drops of blood deep within. On whomsoever these appeared, the moment they did so, the end would come, would come within just one or two hours, or it might happen that the person had one day's delay. Now in this case, John possibly refers to the black spots from the flea bite, or more likely, the petechiae resulting from septicemic plague. The quick death that follows supports this latter possibility. John also says, and I quote, To others, however, neither this happened nor that. But as they were looking at each other and talking, they began to totter and fell, either in the streets or at home, in harbours, on ships, in churches and everywhere. It might happen that a person was sitting at his work on his craft, holding his tools in his hands and working, and he would totter to the side and his soul would escape. Now, in this case, where John speaks of the lack of any symptoms before death, we might have a case of primary septicemic plague. From an ancient medical perspective, ancient persons believed that plague was the result of polluted air, vapours and stench. From a religious perspective, however, plague was often seen as chastisement, and this is also John's view. The general Syriac term for plague or an epidemic is Maltana, which means mortality or death. This is also the word used by the Peshta, and it is also the word for plague used mostly by John of Ephesus. The, the specific Syriac word for bubonic plague is Sharuta, although John does not use this word. The Justinian plague persisted for almost two centuries, with sporadic waves hitting various parts of the Mediterranean. It should be noted briefly that there are two approaches to the Justinian plague in terms of its effects. The first is the so-called maximalist approach, which is most common in scholarship. For instance, Karl Harper's 2017 publication, The Fate of Rome, Climate, Disease and the End of an Empire, published by Princeton University Press, is one of the more recent studies adopting this approach. In simple terms, the maximalist approach suggests that the plague of Justinian was so devastating and wide-ranging that it might have killed up to a third of the population, tens of millions of people in other words. The plague, along with numerous other factors, it is argued, led to the eventual fall of the Roman Empire. The maximalist approach has recently been critiqued by a group of scholars led by Lee Mordecai and Mill Eisenberg, who propose a less dramatic minimalist approach. They argue that the premises of the maximalist approach do not stand up to scrutiny, especially because of the maximalist approach's reliance on literary sources, of which the empiric empirical history of the plague might be dubious. They argue that the mortality, mortality rates were not nearly as high as previously thought, although densely populated cities were hit hardest. Now, I will not further argue about this matter here today, but I should say that I am more inclined to follow a minimalist approach to the Justinian plague. 
John of Ephesus is one of the main literary sources for the beginning of the Justinian plague. And I hope that by critically analyzing John's account, we can move beyond the maximalist approach and better understand why John writes what he writes about the plague. This is also why it is, it is important to understand the discursive aspects of pandemics and plagues, since, since the literary accounts might not always be what they seem to be. I want to propose that one way of understanding John's account of the plague, and this need not be the only way, is to see it as a type of cathartic writing, a sort of literary debriefing after experiencing the trauma of the plague, witnessing the scale of death in the densely populated city of Constantinople in the early 540s, most likely left John with a severe case of post-traumatic stress syndrome or PTSD. John only wrote his account of the plague three years after the experience. John needs to deal with his grief. For ancient authors, grief was not a bad emotion in itself. However, an excess of grief had the ability to dominate the soul, which could lead to despondency and depression. The second century Roman physician Galen believed that intense grief could lead to medical depression or melancholy. This did pose a very real threat to the soul. When John writes his uh, story about the plague, first he says that it is a form of lament for him. He writes, and I quote, Now, for the beginning of this narrative, the blessed prophet Jeremiah has proved most helpful to us, being versed in raising songs of lamentation amid groans over the affliction and ruins of his people. Thus, he would be a model for the present writer, or lamenter, in putting down the story of this terrible and mighty scourge with which the whole world was lashed in our days. Unquote. John describes his writing as lamentation which is considered to be very, a very important phase in, ancient, in the ancient experience of grief and trauma. Witnessing so much death would have had an effect on any person. So John describes the plague in religiously hyperbolic and highly graphic terms. John is re, John's retelling is quite different from, say, the account of Procopius, who was in Constantinople at the very same time. Procopius seems to maintain that an emotional distance, uh, he, he seems to maintain at least an emotional distance when telling his story. And some have even described his view as being clinical. John's story I can only describe with one word, visceral. The plague is very personal, even personified to John. He witnesses it only on his journey to Egypt and as he goes back to Constantinople. The plague almost seems to stalk them as they travel. When the plague finally reaches Constantinople, the descriptions almost become apocalyptic and mythological in nature. John speaks of terrifying spectral figures on infected ships in the ocean, of demons appearing to be angels and letting people perform idolatry. His account reads almost like a vision from Ezekiel or Daniel or Revelation. The desolation of the plague's landscape becomes a playground of demons. He describes the delirium of the populace in highly disturbing terms. Some reached back to what was in John's eyes superstitions, like throwing pitchers from the windows of the upper stories of buildings, hoping that death would flee. Even worse, people associated death with the figure of the monk. John says, and I quote, again, it was affected by demons who deceive people that when those who had acted so foolishly by breaking pictures started to, la to lament that, that they had failed in what they imagined their deception would achieve, but instead were drawing closer each day to utter perdition. The demons then appeared to them, wishing to mock the garb of piety, that is the monastic habit of the shorn of the monks of the clerics and of the clerics. Therefore, when either a monk or a cleric appeared, the people gave a yell and fled before him, supposing that he was death in person who would destroy them. Thus, this foolishness was manifested in the idea that death would come in the likeness of the shorn ones. It befell simple people especially and the populace of the city, so that hardly anybody wearing the monastic habit would appear on the streets, 
and for on seeing them, they fell upon each other, fled and huddled together, crying, Where are you going? We belong to God's mother. We belong to such and such a martyr or patron. We belong to such and such an apostle. In other stories, people are struck down by angels when they hope to loot houses and buildings. John's account of the plague is populated with demons, angels and monsters. John needs these supernatural figures in order to make sense of the magnitude of the plague's effect in Constantinople. How else could one account for so much death? Corpses being stacked on top of each other, piles of babies like bricks on each other, virgins, beautiful young maidens, young strong men, all in mass graves mixed with mud, blood and pus. Rivers, even oceans of dead bodies are reported. Now, while John provides numbers of casualties similar to those reported by Procopius, it is these face-to-face -face scenes and behaviours that disturb John the most. This is John of Ephesus' discourse about the plague. It is terrible, disturbing and great in its magnitude, because that was its effect on John's soul. It needs to be of this nature, because the serious psychic trauma John experienced required a strong cathartic remedy. It is no surprise that when reading John's account, some would reconstruct a maximalist narrative from it. But we should not assume that the terrible experience in the densely populated cities was the norm all over the region. Why is John's account of the plague of Justinian so graphic and disturbing? And it truly is. When reading the story for the first time, even before the COVID-19 outbreak, I shared John's trauma. This material is not to be read lightly and not to be prescribed to students without a disclaimer and a warning. But John's account is so disturbing because it needs to be so, especially for John. The shock of retelling might aim to revive John's and his readers' emotions, their pathos. Why? Because one of the problems that John describes is emotional desensitization from the plague. He writes, and I quote, now, only now, the hearts of people were numb, and therefore there was no more weeping or funeral laments. But people were stunned as if giddy with wine. They were smitten in their hearts and had become numb. Later, he writes, Therefore, it was not easy to find anyone who was firm in mind, but as it is written, they reeled and staggered like drunken men, and they were at their wit's end. It, ha it happened in this way. Being stupefied and confused, each talked to his friend like men drunk as a result of liquor. Thus, through drunkenness resulting from the chastisement of people, they were easily led to the madness of mind. The delirium experienced by the people could either have been from the social trauma all experienced, or from the plague itself, of course, which did cause medical delirium. John notes that people were almost drunk from grief, and fully desensitized. John often repeats the phrase, and I quote, with what tears should I, should I have wept? It is important for John to revive his emotions, to verbalize them, not only for his own psychological health. The tale of the plague also warns that those who were drunk from grief fell prey to demonic influence. For John, writing about the plague may indirectly protect his soul from demonic onslaughts. We should remember that by the time John is writing his account, the plague was not yet over. While, John seems, while John's writing seems to be an act of care for his own soul, there is also another dimension to his writing. John gives a second reason for writing his account, and I quote, Thus, when I, read a wretch, wanted to include these matters in a record of history, my thoughts were seized many times by stupor, and for many reasons I plan to omit it, firstly because all mouths and tongues are insufficient to relate it, and moreover because even if there could be found such that would record at least a little from them from among the multitude of matters, what use would it be when the entire world was tottering and reaching its dissolution, and the length of generations was cut short? And for whom would he would he, would he who wrote be writing? But 
Then I thought that it was right that through our writings we should inform our successors and transmit to them at least a little from among the multitude of matters concerning our chastisement. Even if together with us they are knocking on the gate of, cons of the consummation, perhaps during this remainder of the world which will come after us, they will fear and shake because of the terrible scourge with which we were lashed through our transgressions and become wiser through the chastisement of us wretches and be saved from God's wrath here in this world and from future torment. We can clearly see John almost understood this as the end of the world. John also understands the plague as a form of chastisement. And while he speaks of sin in general, one specific disease of the soul stands out above all others in John's account. Greed. The majority of early Christian authors understood greed as a serious illness of the soul. It has also been argued that almsgiving and charity were constructed as psychic remedies. John tells us that the poor died first. A very plausible observation. John views this as a form of grace bestowed onto the poor since many of them received a proper burial and they, and they were spared the horrors of witnessing the full visitation of the plague. John further tells us, and I quote, As in the days of Noah, when that blessed man together with his, fam with his family heard the message of the threat and of perdition, he grew afraid and did not disregard it, but took care to build the ark which became a salvation for him and for his own life and for all he had. So also in this time, in like manner, as did that blessed man, many people managed in a few days to build ships for themselves, consisting of almsgiving, that these might transport them across that flood of flame. Others, in pain of tears, achieved it by almsgiving, and also by distributing their possession, possessions to the needy. Still others, by lament and humility, vigils, abstinence, and woeful calling upon God, in this way, many people who feared and trembled were able to buy for themselves the kingdom. The Ark of Almsgiving was one of the only forms of salvation from the plague, John believed. John is a positive witness to the Emperor Justinian and his referendarius, Theodore. The charitable and selfless acts of the Emperor and his referendarius are exemplary in John's view. They helped all people and especially assisted with burials and the distribution of food. Now, moreover, John specifically zooms in on the greed of people during this time. There are several stories in John's account about people who wanted to loot the, house, the homes of those who had died. These people entered the homes, but as soon as they took their loot and tried to leave, they were smited by an angel or the plague itself. The rhetoric of rot, decay and disgust permeates John's story of the plague. It has been demonstrated that the rhetoric of decay, disgust and excrement in early Christianity often functioned as an invective against the luxurious and decadent lifestyles of the rich and the greedy. In this account of the plague, all bodies simply become discarded and rotten flesh. Beauty and innocence are despoiled and as John says, human beings are treated like dead animals trampled upon and rendered to blood and rot and pus. He often points out that the plague wiped out distinctions between masters and slaves. Lavish funerals were a thing of the past and wills and testaments were useless. Anyone who accepted gifts or bribes for whatever reason fell dead on the spot. As John himself says, and I quote, all gold became cursed and everyone hated gold and silver. People did not even except their salaries. John ends his story thus, and I quote, Although at the beginning we desisted from recording the memory of these events, three years later, arranging in a story the lamentations one after another, we recorded those matters for the remembrance of the sorrow and afflictions which happened before our eyes. Also, the eastern regions were overwhelmed by the same horrors which have not yet come to an end. We have left these matters for the remembrance of other people who will come after us in order, that, in order that when they hear about the chastising of us, fools and provokers, and about the sentence for our sins, they may become wise and it is 
and it is and they and that they may cease to anger the one from whom everything is easy to do and that they may repent and ask mercy continually lest this chastisement also be thrown upon them in conclusion john of ephesus's account of the justinian plague is a visceral hyperbolic even mythological catharsis of for his own soul a treatment for his own ptsd having witnessed the plague and a warning for the souls of his readers but the purpose of john's narrative was not simply to relate history and we should be careful to assume john's work is a faithful historical account it probably is not fully john paints his image of the plague with broad and vivid strokes which does lend itself to a maximalist narrative but in order to do the text justice we should be more attentive to the discourse of plague in this work and others a discourse is always strategic and purposeful i suggest then that john's account of the plague serves first as a remedy for the grief of his own soul a way of coming to grips with what he witnessed and a way of resensitizing his soul resensitizing reviving his emotions both to ensure psychic health and to ward away possible demonic assaults he writes in the first instance to and for himself but john also had to make sense of these terrible events for his own psychic health he also had to ask what purpose could so much death and decay serve now three years later john is trying to see the order within the chaos the only answer to this is that the plague was god's chastisement for sin and especially a response against human greed in john's story of the plague the real and most dangerous disease is not bubonic plague but greed he writes his tale with a pedagogical purpose to warn people of the dangers of greed john's whole discourse of the plague fits in with the early christian maxim so well articulated by john chrysostom all luxury is excrement i do hope that this brief engagement with plague and pandemic as a discourse in early christianity might also might, might also help us to think further about the discursive nature and impact of the covid 19 pandemic although covid 19 as a virus and pandemic will not always be with us the discourse of the plague the discursivity of the pandemic is here to stay Thank you for this opportunity and I look forward to hearing your feedback and I wish you a safe and a prosperous time ahead. Thank you very, very much and goodbye.